Hello, AP Calculus students. Mr. Ford here with a homework tutorial. This is 722. Right away, I can tell you we're not going to do 767, but the rest of them I think are fair game, so let's just get right into it. Uh, once again, Greta is in a pickle. She is trying to follow, solve the following equation and knows she can use u substitution, and she thinks that if she lets u equal tangent of x, she can write the equation as a quadratic equation, and she is correct. We've done this kind of trick before. I don't generally like these problems of this style because I think this is a trick. And I don't think this is really technically u substitution since we're not using it to integrate. And u substitution is an integration tool. But, you know, anyway, this does show you kind of what's at the heart of u substitution anyway, is that if you frame the question just a little differently, if you just think about the tangent of x being u, the problem looks a lot different and is a lot easier to work with. I think in this case, we can actually solve it for x. I think x is the key here. Um, let's actually try to factor this. I'm looking for two things that, well, well can I? Can I factor it? Is there anything, what multiplies to 10? 2 and 5, 1 and 10. None, neither of those subtract to 1. So we might need to think about the, uh, wow, this sucks. Let me take a look at the answer really quick. I might throw this problem out. Um, oh, oh, I forgot about the 3. <laughs> I missed the three there. Okay, that makes the problem a little more palatable. So let's try to factor it then. So we need a three u and we need a u and uh, equals zero. So we need things that multiply to 10 and combine with the three to make the negative one. So um, I like two and five because two times three is six and six is one more than five. So I think I'm gonna have a minus two here and a plus three there. No, a plus 5 there. I think that's going to work. Because 5 times, or yeah, negative 2 times 5 is negative 10. And then I'll have 5u here and negative 6u there. That'll give me the negative 1. So I wish I had a way to explain what's going on in my brain other than what's going on right there. So I just guess and check until I get it, honestly. I know there's slip and slide method and stuff like that too. But anyway, since these two things multiplied together and the answer is 0, that means that one of them has to be 0. Um, the one on the left would happen if u was negative 5 thirds. And the one on the right would happen if u was 2. Um, this looks like a solution, except for we're not solving for u. We want to solve for x. So we should replace u with its original thing. We said that u is the tangent of x. So the tangent of x has to be negative 5 thirds, or the tangent of x has to be 2. And we can solve both of these problems with an inverse tangent, because that's how we would solve for x x could be the inverse tangent of negative 5 thirds, or x could be the inverse tangent of 2. And fortunately for us, inverse tangent has a domain of all real numbers, so we can go ahead and plug anything into this and it works. So that's cool. Okay, let's take a look at question 766. Remember Eric and the 16-foot tall lamppost? Uh, I would not blame you if you did not. Eric is five feet tall. He's walking away from the lamppost at a rate of five feet per second. And we want to know at what rate is the tip of his shadow moving away from the lamppost. This is a, a relatively challenging um, related rates problem. But let me draw the picture for you. Hopefully, hopefully it'll help you kind of map out what's going on. We have a lamppost that is 16 feet tall, a very constant six feet tall. We have Eric, who's a very constant five feet tall. And the lamppost is kind of creating this shadow with Eric. So there's uh, two right triangles kind of buried inside of each other, and that's really what we're looking for, or that we're dealing with here. Now, x we're going to define as the rate at which, x, well, x is the distance from Eric to the lamppost. So that's just this little chunk of the, the distance. That's x right there. Um, we're going to call this distance s for shadow. And, you know, maybe for his clarity in this problem, I think we're going to call this z. I don't really have a good letter for that, but that's the z is equal to x plus s. Now, the method that I'm going to show you for this problem, you know, there's probably different ways to do it. But you'll, you'll you realize that this problem is, is pretty basic once you break it down into its core concepts. The only thing that we know from this problem, by the way, is that dx dt, the rate at which he's moving away from the lamppost, is 4 feet per second. That's the only thing we're kind of told. And what we're looking for, we want to know at what distance the tip of the shadow is moving. We really want dz dt. Now, it's going to be tough to isolate z, but let's try for a minute. It's actually not too tough, because if you think about it, you got a pair of similar triangles here. And 
these highlighted sides I'm looking at are the ones that match up. So right away, I think a fair proportion to write is that um, 5 over s equals 16 over z. That's a really good proportion to start off with. That's your equation that relates together um, some of the parts of this problem. What's going to be really tricky is getting x into this because we don't know anything about ds dt. We, need, we know dx dt. But let's go as far as we can with this setup. Let's start by cross multiplying. We'll get 5 times z equals 16 times s. We do our cross multiplication. And we're really interested in dz dt, so let's solve this for z. Let's divide by 5 on both sides, and we'll realize that z has to be 16 fifths of whatever s is. And furthermore, we can go even one more step and uh, do the rate equation. Take the derivative of this and get dz dt. Since 16 fifths is just a constant, it's going to be 16 fifths times ds dt. Now, we have to kind of put a pin in this right here because we can't go any further. We don't know anything about ds dt. So we have to think backwards and actually solve a problem that we solved on another homework a while ago. Um, we're going to solve for ds dt. So let's try to figure out how we can incorporate x into the problem. We're going to leave this right where it is, but let's, let's think about a different problem. Actually, I want to think about the exact same problem, but a little bit differently. I want to use this relationship that z is actually equal to x plus s. So how about this? Let's, let's try, this. we'll call this phase two of the problem. 5 over s is equal to 16 over uh, x plus s. Let's think about the exact same proportion. How about that? Um, if we do the cross multiplication here, I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit so we can focus our attention here. We get 5 times the quantity x plus s equals 16s. And if we do the distribution, we get 5x plus 5s equals 16s. And if we do the subtraction, we can realize that 5x equals 11s. And so um, since, since we're interested here in s, I think, because the missing piece of the puzzle down here is ds dt, let's focus our attention on solving for s in this problem. s is going to be 5 elevenths of x if we divide by 11 on both sides. And so ds dt, which is kind of what we're looking for here, is going to be 5 elevenths of dx dt. And, you know, what's really groovy about this is that we actually know what dx dt is. We know that's 4. So this is 5 elevenths times 4, and that is 20 elevenths. I'm going to remind myself this is ds dt. I just like to put another equal sign there in the end. So again, I don't know if this is the only way to solve this problem. I suspect that it's not, but this is how I ended up doing it. Um, now that I know that ds dt is 20 over 11, you can bring that information down over here and plug it in. And you can figure out what dz dt is. This is 16 fifths times ds dt, 20 over 11. And the, the 20 and the 5 can uh, become just a 4. 16 times 4 is 64. And so 64 over 11 is the answer here, and that is... Decimal, decimal approximation would be uh, 5.818 feet per second. That's the rate at which a shadow is moving. So similar triangles are really popular in related rates problems because they imply that one side has to have the same relationship with another side, and that's a really easy way to map out or connect two variables that you don't know together. I'll leave that there. You, now's a good time to pause and really ponder about how we solve this problem. Again, there's probably other ways to isolate z and connect it to s. It's up to you. Um, we're not doing 767, although it's not too tough. All you'd have to do, honestly, the, the distance between the two shores is the uh, north bank, which is the cosine of pi x over 2 plus 6. That's the one distance 1 minus distance 2, which is natural log of 9 minus x. All you would need to do honestly, is feed this into a derivative, I would use the calculator. I'd take the derivative of this entire expression, and I would figure out when it equals zero. That would be your maximum or minimum. No. So, okay, anyway, let's look at 768. No calculator. Determine where the following functions are uh, not continuous and or not differentiable. I'm looking at the problem right now, I'm thinking, do I need some space for this? Um, I can tell you with question A that it's not differentiable at x equals 3, at least. I can tell you that right now. Absolute value functions are just kind of a thing to know. 
uh, not differentiable when the absolute value is zero. So I can tell you that it's non-differentiable, non-diff, at least at x equals three right now. Um, as far as not continuous, well, I don't know yet. I'm gonna have to look at some, we'll have to do some work here for this problem, but I can tell you at least there, wherever the point of the absolute value is, that's gonna be a non-differentiable point right away. But let's do some work with this problem. We got, this is for question A. We are comparing uh, 1 half x squared plus 3 over 2 to the absolute value of 3 minus x. Um, what we need to test basically, what, here's the question we're answering. Is the 1 half x squared plus 3 over 2, is that equal to the absolute value of 3 minus x? That's the question. Um, is it equal at x equals 1? Because if you look at the piecewise function we've got here, there is a break. Oh, sorry, at negative 1. The break in the piecewise function is at negative 1. Both absolute values and polynomials are continuous all the time. So we don't need to worry about any other point except for negative 1 where these two functions meet. Do they meet at the same place is the question. So we're going to plug in negative 1 for x and see if they do. I suspect they do not, but... That's just my, my, my hypothesis. If you plug in negative 1, well, let's see. Negative 1 squared is positive 1, so this is 1 half plus 3 halves. That's 2. Over here, 3 minus negative 1 gives you 4, and so this becomes 2 equals 4, and that's going to be a big old no. Sorry, Chief. Since they do not give you the same number when you plug in negative 1, that means that this is a piecewise function where the left function does one thing and the right function does another thing, but they do not meet at the same point, so they're not continuous. And since they're not continuous, it's also not differentiable. Since in order to be differentiable, which is smooth for us, you have to be continuous first. So differentiability implies continuity, but not the other way around. So in this case, you can add negative 1 to your list for both non-differentiable and not continuous. Let's try B, which is going to give us the same kind of game to play, but two points of separation. Um, first of all, I notice that we have a... Let's see here. If I'm looking at things that we have to worry about, for this part of the function, 2 over m minus 3, um, that's a problem. That's not differentiable if m is 3, but we don't need to worry about it because this is only for values of m that are less than 2. So we'll never be plugging 3 into this function. So 3 is actually okay here. Uh, the next function is a square root. We would normally worry about square roots if there are negative numbers. But remember, we're plugging in the numbers 2 through 5 into this thing, and 6 minus 2 and 6 minus 5, none of those numbers give you negative numbers, so these are all good too. And then the last part of it is just a linear equation, 1 half m minus 7 halves. So that's also good. So, so as just a spot check, I, I don't see any spots inside of the functions themselves where there might be a spot of non-continuity or differentiability. So we're all good. Now we need to check the, uh, the points where they meet. So let's start with 2. For these, we only really care about these two functions because those ones meet up at x equals 2. So again, we're kind of answering the same question. Is 2 over m minus 3 equal to the negative square root of 6 minus m, specifically when x equals 2? So do these two answers give us the same thing? Do these two piecewise functions meet at the same point, or do they not? Uh, let's plug in 2. We get 2 over 2 minus 3, which is negative 1 over there. And over here we get negative square root of 6 minus 2, which is 4. 2 divided by negative 1 is negative 2, and the square root of 4 is 2, and then we make it negative, so it's negative 2. So yes, these are totally continuous. So, so far we have no points of continuity, no points of, discont of discontinuity, and no points of non-differentiability. So we're good there. Let's try, you know, I should have mapped out some space for this. Let me, let me section off my work here for this. Uh, let's go ahead and try part B. We're going to test to see if, jeez, oh, we're going to get some room. How about the space right here? We're going to test to see if the negative square root of 6 minus m is equal to 1 half m minus 7 halves when x is 5. Now we're going to talk about what's happening when they meet up at 5. Do we get the same number? So again, I suspect not, but we'll take a look. x equals 5. So... <laughs> Let's plug in 5. We get negative square root of 1, 6 minus 5 there. And here we get uh, 1 half times 5 is 5 halves minus 7 halves. 
And look at this. These are both negative 1. Negative 1 and negative 1. This is pretty cool. Right there. So I think we're, we're continuous again. Um, you know, I can tell you this now. At, at this stage in the game, I'm going to say I'm, I'm over this problem. I want to move on. But uh, I do want to point out that there is kind of one more thing to think about is the non-differentiability. Um, non-differentiability is a tricky thing to think about. Um, what we would need to do next for this, this is for part B, we would want to think about the derivatives of these things. The derivative of 2 over m minus 3 and the derivative of negative 6, negative square root of 6 minus m, for example. Um, those are not easy derivatives to think about. Let's see. For the derivative of 2 over m minus 3, it's the original bottom times the derivative of the top, which is 0, minus the original top times the derivative of the bottom, which is 1, all over m minus 3 squared. And that is going to be negative 2 over m minus 3 squared. Uh, what about the derivative of negative square root of 6 minus m? The derivative there is going to be negative 1 over 2 times the square root of 6 minus m times negative 1 from the chain rule. So it's going to become a positive 1, like that. These are the derivatives of those first two chunks of the problem. And again, if we test at x equals 2, will we get the same thing? This is for differentiability for this problem. Again, if we plug in a 2 here, we're going to get negative 2 over uh, negative 1 squared. And over here, we get 1 over 2 times the square root of 4. Uh, and this gives us, let's see, this is 1 over 4, and this is going to be negative 2. So these are not the same thing. So there is a point of non-differentiability at x equals 2. So if we check the derivatives, uh, not differentiable, we check the derivatives, we see the derivatives are not the same thing at x equals negative 2. If we try that same game for the other pair, the last function is 1 half m minus 7 over 2, which is really nice because the derivative is just 1 half, which is cool. Like that. This is the derivative zone, by the way, down here. Again, if we check these guys when m is 5, I used x earlier. Whoops, it's m. If we plug in 5 for this, check out what happens. We get 1 over 2 times the square root of 1 versus 1 half. These guys are the same thing. So the derivatives are the same at m equals 5, but not the same at m equals 2. And so we actually have differentiability there also. We have continuity and differentiability at 5, but we have continuity and non-differentiability at 2. So that makes the problem a little more complicated, but... Um, as long as you are aware of continuity, meaning that the two functions are the same value at a certain x point, and differentiability, the derivatives are the same at a certain meeting point, that's all you got to look at here. In this case, the only one that causes a problem is the differentiability at x equals negative 2. Let's start with 769 for our next problem here. While chasing a rabbit, a greyhound starts from rest and accelerates at 6 feet per second squared until it reaches its maximum speed. Uh... How long does it take for the Greyhound to reach its maximum speed of 30 feet per second? So let's think about this. What we're going to do, we know the acceleration function is a very constant 6 in this problem. Um, we are looking for, in question A, we want to know for what value of t does the velocity equal 30, which is its maximum speed of 30 feet per second. I suppose, since we're using the word speed, we probably want to think about the absolute value of the velocity. But since the Greyhound only starts at rest and gets faster, we don't really need to worry about that too much in this particular problem. Of course, the question is, what's the velocity function? And the best we can do right now is do 6t plus c by taking the antiderivative of the acceleration to find the velocity. The good news is that we know that the, it started at rest. He starts from rest. So we know that the initial velocity, or v of 0, is 0. And so if you put those pieces together, that tells us that c equals 0. So we know that the velocity function is really just 6t right there. So if we think about this, when does 6t equal 30? t is 5. It's going to happen after 5 seconds, like that. Pretty straightforward, but you have to think backwards about this kind of stuff. 
We'll be talking in the next section after we finish U substitution. One of the last things that we'll do before your AP test, we'll be talking about how to solve algebraically situations like this where the initial condition tells you where you were at a certain point. But it's not that hard. Actually, we just did it, honestly. How far did the Greyhound have to travel to catch the rabbit if it took a total of eight seconds to catch it? So our question now is really this integral. What is the integral from zero to eight of your velocity function? Um, because what we're looking at is for distance. Distance is going to be um, an integral from zero to eight of our velocity function, v of t. Well, let me just check that really quick. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right. I'm just going to spot check my math on this really quick to think about what I need it to be. Uh, where did the Greyhound have to travel? The antiderivative of 6t would be uh, 3t squared. And so 3 times 8 squared is that number. You're not saying it. That's not what the book says. It took 8 seconds to catch it. How far did the gray hat have to travel? It took to catch the rabbit. So I'm not getting the same answer that the book has, and now I'm confused. This is the part of the video where I stare at the problem blankly, and you... Just, I don't know, click forward until I write, start writing something down. Oh. Oh, I see. Hang on. I think I, think I know what's going on here. 5 times 8 squared. Sorry, 3 times 5 squared is 75 plus 30 times 3 is 90. Okay, yeah. All right. I got it. I had to wrap my head around that for a minute. You know, I'm, I'm tempted to say it was this really quick. It was, it was this integral from 0 to 8 of vt dt. There's a little bit of a trick, though. If you read the situation carefully, um, he accelerates at 6 feet per second squared until he reaches his maximum speed, and that's the key to this problem. And we also know the maximum speed is 30 feet per second, and we also know that it only took him 5 seconds to get there. So really, this answer is, is incorrect. What we need is the following. We need the integral from 0 to 5 of v of t dt because the velocity is changing up until the point when he hits his maximum velocity of 30 feet per second, and we know that takes 5 seconds to handle. For the next 3 remaining seconds, because we know it takes 8 seconds for him to catch the rabbit, um, for the remaining 3 seconds, he's traveling at 30 feet per second. So to this, we're going to add 30 times 3 to take care of those last 3 seconds. So we're going to add 90, essentially. Now, this is an easy integral to evaluate because the, uh, it's the integral from 0 to 5 of a pretty simple function. So we're going to do 90 plus the integral from 0 to 5 of 6t dt. We can do this without a calculator, too. It's actually really simple. Uh, the antiderivative of 6t, well, you need t squared over 2. As part of your problem, you got to lay a trap for the 2 to fall into. Um, and if you put the 6 up here, you might even see that the 6 and the 2 will actually cancel out and become 3. So 3t squared is there. You do not need a plus c because we're going to evaluate this from 5 to 0, just the 3t squared part. The other nice thing there is all you really got to do is plug in 5 because plugging in 0 gives you 0. So we're going to have 90 plus 30, sorry, 3 times 5 squared. And that's 90 plus 75 which is 165 uh, feet, which is the distance that the Greyhound needed to travel in order to catch the rabbit. A good physics-based problem here, connecting acceleration to velocity and then to distance. I don't necessarily like that little trick there in problem B because that kind of stuff, I don't know. I'm, I'm spotty on whether or not it shows up on the AP test, but I feel like it's a little bit beyond what this class is supposed to be about. So, okay, anyway, let's try 770. After analyzing a function, Edwin knew that f prime of 3 is 0. Good thing. That means it's a critical point. It doesn't mean it's, an a, it's a maximum or minimum. It just means that it's a spot where the derivative is 0. So the function is horizontal. Uh, and f double prime of 3 is negative 2. So we know that it's concave down at that point, according to our second derivative. He therefore concluded 
that f has an absolute maximum, an absolute maximum, whoa, at x equals 3. Edwina, his girlfriend, is not so sure. I don't know if my name was Edwin. I don't know if I would date a girl named Edwina, but okay. Uh, explain why Edwina is unwilling to accept Edwin's conclusion. If we draw a picture of this, you know, we have a concave down curve. Looks like this. And we do know that there is, in fact, a point when x is 3. Uh, let, let me just give an x-axis to this to make it a little... Just give it a little context to this. 1, 2, 3, like that. There is a point at x equals 3 where you do have a horizontal tangent. The derivative is 0. And the second derivative is negative, so it's concave down. He's concluding that this is the absolute maximum, which, which means the, that there is no other point on this entire function that is more than that. And I think his mistake is that, you know, the function, we don't know anything else about it other than this one little slice. I mean, the function could do this. And then you'd be wrong. So I think... I don't have a really good written answer for this problem. I think this picture answers the question. We don't know what the rest of the function is doing. I think it's a good way to answer this. We only know what's happening at x equals 3. There is a local maximum for sure, but an absolute maximum is awfully bold. We don't know what the rest of the function is doing. I think it's fair to say that there is a local maximum at x equals 3, but probably not a global maximum. Maybe, but we don't know. And let's do one more. Look at 771. I got about four minutes before my uh, fifth hour shows up. So we are tasked with kind of connecting, um, you know, area under the curve, second derivatives with first derivatives and, and original functions here. Um, capital F of x is the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt for the function y equals f of t graphed it right. Um, and the question is, when is capital F of x at a maximum on the range from 0 to 15? You know, if you look at this, capital F of x, you might think about it as the area under the curve under this f of t function that we got here. And if you think about that area, it is increasing, and then it's increasing some more, and then it's increasing some more, and increasing and increasing and increasing. It's always positive. We're just constantly adding area to this thing as we move to the right. We're just adding more and more area. So there is no turnaround point. Its maximum happens at x equals 15. If the graph were to, say, dip below the x-axis or something, like let's say it was increasing, increasing, increasing. Let's say the graph here took a turn and went down there. I would say the maximum would happen at 10 because the graph starts subtracting area under the curve. But this one's always positive, so it's just going to keep increasing. So I'm saying at x equals 15. Uh, is capital F increasing, decreasing, or both over the interval from 0 to 8? It's definitely increasing the entire time. It's increasing on the entire range from 0 to 15. So it's just, we're just keep, if you think about adding little rectangles to this, you would be adding, 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 adding value all the way up until 8, and you would keep going to there too. So it's strictly increasing. As far as question C goes, this one's going to take the most uh, of our, our muscle to answer here. I'm actually going to do it down here. Capital F of 4. That is the area under the curve from 0 to 4 of F of T dt. And for this, we're going to need a little geometry. It's a quarter of a circle. You have a radius of 4 and a radius of 4. So this is going to be 1 fourth of pi times 4 squared, which is actually pretty easy to answer because one of those 4s will cancel out with the 1 fourth. So it's just going to be 4 pi. You could evaluate that if you want to, but unnecessary. For f of 8, which is the next one, capital, oh, sorry, capital F of 10. Again, we're going for the area under the curve from 0 to 10. Now, the nice thing here is that we already know, I shouldn't have erased that. We already know from the previous problem that this is just going to be 4 pi plus the integral from 4 to 10 of f of t dt. Since we already know that the integral from 0 to 4 is 4 pi. So let's think about this area now from 4 to 10 of this right there. You know, there's a, probably a lot of different ways we can do this. Um, we're going to need to break it up into some chunks. Honestly, I would break it up into a uh, right triangle and a trapezoid. Probably the best way to handle that. I know that this triangle here is, that is 1, 2, 3, 4 on this side. And 
Oh, looks like it is six up top. I'm just going to eyeball that. Yeah, six. And so that is one half of four times six. So that's 12 in that little chunk. Um, this one, my, my fourth I was going to come in. I'm just going to keep doing this problem there. Uh, this problem here is, I think that's supposed to be four right there. So the area of this trapezoid is one half times six plus four, which is 10, times two, which is its width. And that's just going to be 10 in there. So it's going to be 4 pi plus 12 plus 10. So 22 pi, I think. 22 plus 4 pi. I think that looks good to me. I don't know. I'm looking at the book answer. I'm going, I don't even know how you guys got that. Is there any more? Is there more information to this than I don't know? I have no idea how they got a weird decimal answer for that. So I'm going to put my answer down because I think I'm right. 4 pi plus 22 is the area there. And the area under the curve... For f of 15, you know, again, we can kind of think about this. This is probably the easier question to answer because if we erase all of this work here, you know, we already know that the area of the circle is 4 pi, or I guess, sorry, the quarter circle. We know the area of uh, this, this bottom line there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And it looks like the height, I'm going to go ahead and eyeball that as 6. So that's 11 right there. So the area of the triangle is 1 half times 6 times 11 which is 33. So the uh, total area is 33 plus the 4 pi that we have there. I like that answer quite a bit. And one last question here, question D, list the intervals on 0, 15 for which f double prime of x is greater than 0. So that's your second derivative. So if we think about the capital F of x is the area under the curve. The uh, derivative of that, f double prime of x, that's just the function itself, f of t. And so capital F double prime of x is the derivative of the function. In other words, the slope. So we're looking for places where the slope of that graph is positive. So where is the slope greater than 0? So we look at our function. We can see that it's decreasing this entire time. It's also decreasing on this domain here. But it is increasing right here on this red line there from x equals 4 to x equals 8. So I would say that the second derivative of capital F of x is happening, F double prime of x is greater than 0 on the range from 4 to 8. And I like that answer quite a bit. Looking for where the slope is positive. Hey, thanks for making it through this. I know my uh, third hour is coming in, so I'm going to stop this video and post it as soon as I can. You guys are awesome. I'll see you in the next video.